Thank you. So the conditions we're talking here are worldwide very prevalent. In fact, the world's most common genetic conditions are thalassemia and sickle cell anemia that affects um, where two thirds of the world population lives. And iron overload cardiomyopathy is particularly a major concern there. This is distinct from the primary hemochromatosis, which occurs in, in the typical uh, Caucasian population in which there is increased gut absorption of iron as opposed to uh, congenital anemias, which uh, requires frequent blood transfusion. So the mechanism of iron overload are slightly different, but ultimately they lead to, to iron overload. So in primary hemochromatosis, the process is a bit less aggressive. There is a high burden of liver disease as opposed to secondary iron overload where heart disease is the primary driver of outcomes in these patients. Um, or screening um, uh, protocols in these patients includes the use of cardiac MRI and of course several important hematological markers, which is of course part of the guideline as part of the uh, reversible cause of cardiomyopathy that um, should be screened. This is a seminal publication about 50 years ago, which highlighted um, the important burden of heart disease in these patients. This is an x-ray from a young man showing cardiomegaly, pleural effusions, uh, venous redistribution, a very distended abdomen, splenomegaly, and a bronze discoloration of the skin due to iron deposition. Um, so that's a more severe form of iron overload. And in fact, it was a hematologist here in Toronto in coordination with Peter Liu that made a seminal um, report, Nancy Olivieri, that showed that the survival in these patients are actually driven by the heart disease. So, so the question to us as translational scientists is why is, there, why is heart disease the primary driver of outcomes in patients with um, iron overload? Um, and this was documented both by Nancy Olivieri but also by Gary Brettenham from the US. So two simultaneous studies showing that heart disease and iron overload cardiomyopathy is the major concern in, in these patients. So the key for us to understand this condition is to understand what happens in iron overload. So we have a typical mechanism, transferrin-dependent iron uptake, which under iron overload condition is negatively regulated. So it's turned down to very minimal levels. So what happens in iron overload is that you actually have non-transferrin bound iron that continues to enter into the myocardium that's no longer under negative control. So our job was to figure out why that happens. And, and to make a long story short, we showed that it's actually the L-type calcium channel, a channel that normally regulates um, calcium entry is the channel that regulates uh, calcium um, iron uptake into the heart. So this was our seminal paper. I was working, I was in medical school and I joined Peter Bax. And this was actually our first paper in which we use radioactive um, iron. I don't think they allow you to use that anymore. This was about 20 years ago. And we showed that it does enter the heart, enters the myocardium, and you can block this by using calcium channel blockers. So this was a very important, very early step um, finding to show that calcium channels are important mediators of iron overload cardiomyopathy. So the calcium channels are important triggers. They're shown here in the membrane, the trigger excitation contraction coupling, and this is of course leads to uh, systolic contraction in the heart. Um, so these channels are actually very pivotal in, in mediating excitation contraction coupling in, in the cardiomyocytes. And the channel itself is a very large protein in which the motif three and four have binding sites for various, the various classes of calcium channel blockers. In particular here we have dihydropyridine um, sites in the third and fourth motifs, which is where our, the drugs that we use to treat our patients um, bind to and uh, block the current in these channels. So the first thing we did was to make an animal model of iron overload. And as you can see here, we have very nice evidence of iron deposition in the, in the cardiomyocytes. We can show that nicely with X-ray spectral analysis showing that these are iron-containing peaks. We then went on in our animal models to show that if you give these mice verapamil and amlodipine, you can actually significantly block myocardial iron uptake in, in these animals quite significantly actually here. The decrease in, in levels are actually close to 40 to 50 percent in both a subacute and in a chronic um, protocol. So, very impressive findings in, in, in the uh, preclinical model. 
And this is very important, a histological stain showing that the um, iron deposition in the heart and in response to calcium channel blockers, you can see that the intracellular blue accumulation of iron is what is reduced by calcium channel blockers. So both verapamil and amlodipine was effective, and the intracellular accumulation here of iron is actually unchanged. So these drugs were preventing iron entry into the myocardium while leaving the intracellular iron um, intact. We did quite the opposite. We actually overexpressed the L-type calcium channel in the heart and showed the opposite results. So these are transgenic mice in which they, um, we were able to double the, the myocardial iron burden simply by overexpressing that L-type calcium channel. So very strong genetic evidence that going the opposite way, upregulating that current leads to more uptake of iron and more myocardial damage. So these were uh, our seminal paper here in, in Nature Medicine back in 2003. This was followed by a, a study from a German group that showed a very similar finding with amlodipine. They had a slightly different target, the divalent methyl transporter that may also be targeted by amlodipine, suggesting that maybe liver iron is probably also, the liver may also be protected by amlodipine. Subsequent to this preclinical work, um, our colleagues in, in Italy and Brazil, where iron overload cardiomyopathy is particularly prevalent, performed this very small clinical study using 15 patients, so 10 of which had uh, the placebo control, five of which had amlodipine, five milligrams daily, and they showed that the T2 star in, in the myocardium in these patients were elevated in response to amlodipine therapy as early as six months and persisted at 12 months. So the T2 star is the gold standard way in which you measure tissue iron levels using a cardiac MRI, and it's inversely proportional to your burden of iron. So the more iron you have in the heart, the faster the T2 signal um, relaxes, and therefore the lower the T2 value is. So the elevation here in um, the elevation here in iron level in the T2 value suggests that there's less myocardial iron overload. This study was um, recently replicated in a phase two trial with um, amlodipine in which 62 patients were studied. This was a multi-center, double-blinded, randomized placebo trial of amlodipine by the same group, um, now with a larger number of patients, 62. And in the um, reduction group, they were able to show that you have a significant reduction in myocardial iron burden in response to 12 months of amlodipine therapy. Um, if you looked at the, the prevention group, there was no differences in myocardial iron levels. So you, you see the differences in, in, in the group in which are susceptible particularly to, to iron overload. So not very earlier on in the disease process, but there were nevertheless, in this larger group of patients, there was a significant reduction in myocardial iron levels. So um, very, very impressive results, and I know um, this uh, trial is, is ongoing here in Toronto looking at this, and certainly I think we will need a larger um, phase three multicenter trial to show um, heart clinical um, benefit from, from amlodipine therapy. However, this is really a demonstration of precision-based therapy in which you, you identify the, the, the uh, central pathophysiological basis for the cardiomyopathy and heart failure, and then you use a, a therapeutic agent to target that, that process. We're, we're fortunate here that the therapeutic agent is, is an old drug, a cheap drug, a drug that's widely available, a drug that's available in underdeveloped countries um, and which can be used um, we hope widely at an international level. Um, so this is a therapy that um, as we, we get more clinical evidence that it, that it really helps patients with iron overload, but this is a therapy that can be rapidly um, taken up. Um, this is also important because it really is precision-based medicine because you would not give amlodipine to non-iron overload uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. In fact, it's a contraindicated. It's one of the contraindicated drugs in heart failure, and it comes from not the PRAISE-1 trial, not the original PRAISE-1 trial, which was positive. It comes from this uh, 
seminal follow-up study, the PRAISE-2 trial, which was a, a negative trial for amlodipine in, in non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. So, so, it, so amlodipine doesn't work in, in the non-iron overload dilated cardiomyopathy, but it, it works in iron overload cardiomyopathy because it, it specifically targets the pathophysiology in, in, in that disorder. So this is really, truly um, precision-based um, medicine. Um, so the, the final few slides, um, I'll just show you some of our more recent work in which we have actually tackled the pathophysiology of this process. So we've actually used an um, antioxidant uh, compound that's resveratrol um, to rescue genetic models of iron overload cardiomyopathy. And as you can see here in these um, animal models, you have a lot of fibrosis, this is PSR staining, trichrome staining with resveratrol therapy in this hemojuvalin knockout mice. This is one year of age. These mice were markedly protected. Importantly, the calcium transporter, the CIRCA2, is markedly dung regulated. It, they are protected by resveratrol. And many of the markers of heart disease, including collagen, ANF, BNP, and beta myosin heavy chain, that are hallmarks of, of heart disease, were markedly upregulated in these mice and dramatically suppressed by the resveratrol therapy in, in this uh, preclinical model. We then went on actually and looked at Circa 2 um, therapy, as you know, uh, which made it into phase two clinical trial with the Cupid trial. And we're actually using that same adeno-associated virus provided by Raja Hajar. We're able to uh, overexpress the Circa in, in these mice. Um, and, and showed that we can actually markedly uh, recover their, their, their iron um, calcium transient and improve the diastolic relaxation in these animals, suggesting that circuit dung regulation in response to iron overload is a major driver of the diastolic and systolic dysfunction in these mice. So just a few more slides. So, and then finally, we have set up a program here at the MAS in which we collect all of um, the explanted uh, human hearts, so pediatric adults, and of course, all of the ELVAD cores. Um, so this is a program that uh, we established now about for the past eight years. And we are fortunate in which uh, we're able to collect the heart from an 18-year-old young, young lady who had a heart transplant because of beta thalassemia major. She had over a decade of blood transfusions um, and ultimately resulted in iron overload cardiomyopathy. And so we're fortunate to collect her explanted heart. And what you can see here are these one uh, beautiful demonstration of iron deposition in the myocardium and the digital mapping of these, these granules. So identical to what you saw in the animal model. And the iron peaks are shown here in the same um, energy X-ray analysis of the myocardium. Probably more importantly is that the molecular signatures in this heart were identical to what we saw in the animal model. So in fact, we had the animal model data before we saw what we saw in an in a explanted human heart with iron overload cardiomyopathy. So you have marked down regulation of circa, upregulation of sodium calcium exchanger, and several of these signaling pathways which are altered in the exact same manner in which we saw in the hemojuvalin knockout mice. So in, in summary, um, iron overload cardiomyopathy is a very prevalent condition, maybe, maybe not so in, in this part of the world, and it is a major driver of morbidity and mortality. Um, the preclinical models are valid models of iron overload cardiomyopathy, and in particular the hemojuvalin knockout mice are, are particularly uh, important. The current therapies that we use in, in treating these patients are limited. It's iron chelation therapy for, for um, for um, thalassemias and sickle cell anemia, and phlebotomies for um, hemochromatosis. Um, and uh, as I've, met, I've shown you very nicely, we have important experimental therapies that have now transitioned into clinical trials, in particularly um, amlodipine for iron overload cardiomyopathy, and uh, hopefully we can also start looking at resveratrol therapy in these patients. And then finally, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, Peter Bax and Peter Liu, who are my uh, PhD supervisor, uh, who got me into, in, in, into uh, iron overload cardiomyopathy over 20 years ago, and uh, Roger Hajar for providing us with the Circa virus, and Nancy Andrews for providing us with the hemojuvalin model, and of course many of our tri my trainees, hardworking trainees, 
and our funding bodies. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a question. I think that probably um, mm. uh, you mentioned this, but uh, is there a planned trial to check for uh, clinical important outcomes uh, right. ongoing, or right. it will happen soon? And what is going to be the inclusion exclusion criteria? For example, many of these patients have re uh, restrictive mm. or, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Right. Could patients with reduced e ejection fraction exclude it? Right. And if this is going to be used as an adjuvant therapy? Yes, yes, yes. So the phase two trial that came out in blood six months ago was exactly on top of chelation therapy, which is standard of care. So it was impressive that they were able to see a reduction in iron levels, very significant, very earlier on, um, within six months, uh, within the six to 12 months, even though patients were on chelation therapy. So yes, you would, you would do a trial with amlodipine on patients on chelation therapy. Um, I think it's important, you're absolutely correct, it's important you don't go too late but you don't start too early. So you need to have some degree of iron overload there, and this is where doing the baseline cardiac MRI and having the T2 start to guide you is, is the way to go. Um, you, you do not want to be dealing with uh, dilat end-stage dilated cardiomyopathy and advanced heart failure before, you, before you, um, you, you have this drug on board. So I think you want to start fairly earlier on in the disease process, and you're really looking at early reduction early and, and prompt reduction, sustained reduction in myocardial iron levels. I mean, amlodipine is also an interesting drug. I mean, it's been around for several decades now. It has antioxidant properties. It's a bit of a forgotten property of amlodipine, and it may be having some therapeutic values here in, 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 in these patients. So in addition to blocking the L-type calcium channels, it may be having important antioxidant properties, which actually fits with the resveratrol story. So I think the calcium trial blocker to use for sure is amlodipine, um, but uh, I think we, should, we need to do the, the phase three trial, which I think likely will have to be a multi-center international trial to really prove that uh, this drug improves clinical outcomes. In the blood trial, they did not see an improvement in injection fraction, because over, over a six to 12 month period, you're not gonna be seeing that dramatic change in, in ejection fraction. So, so I think uh, the, the pivotal phase through trial is still, um, we still need that data and hopefully, um, you know, the international community can, can come together and, and, and be, able to, um, to be able to do a trial like this. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Gavin. We'll have you back on the panel. Okay, great, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.